Hey class, this is Blacksicans and Other Reinvented Americans Argument by Richard Rodriguez. There's something unsettling about immigrants because, well, because they chatter incomprehensibly and they get in everyone's way. Immigrants seem to be bent on undoing America. Just when Americans think we know who we are, we are Protestants cold from Western Europe, are we not? The new immigrants appear from Southern Europe and from Eastern Europe. We, we who already are already here, we don't know exactly what the latest comers will mean to our community. How will they fit in with us? Thus, we, we who were here first, we begin to question our own identity. After a generation or two, the grandchildren or great-grandchildren of immigrants to the United States and the grandchildren of those who tried to keep immigrants out of the United States will romanticize the immigrant. We'll begin to see the immigrant as the figure who teaches us most about what it means to be an American. The immigrant, in mythic terms, travels from the outermost rind of America to the very center of American mythology. None of this, of course, can we admit to the Vietnamese immigrant who served us breakfast at the hotel this morning? In another 40 years, we'll be prepared to say to the Vietnamese immigrant that he, with his breakfast tray, with his intuition for travel, with his memory of tragedy, with his recognition of peerless freedoms, he fulfills the meaning of America. In 1997, Gallup conducted a survey on race relations in America, but the poll was concerned with white and black Americans. No question was put to the aforementioned Vietnamese man. There was certainly no question for the Chinese grocer, none for the Guatemalan barber, none for the tribe of Mexican Indians who re-roofed your neighbor's house. The American conversation about race has always been a black and white conversation. But the conversation has become as bloodless as badminton. I have listened to the black and white conversations for most of my life. I was supposed to attach myself to one side or the other without asking the obvious question. What is this perpetual dialect between Europe and Africa? Why does it admit so little reference to anyone else? I am speaking to you as an American in American English that was taught to me by Irish nuns, immigrant women. I wear an Indian face, I answer to a Spanish surname, as well as a California first name, Richard. You might wonder about the complexity of historical factors, the collision of centuries that create Richard Rodriguez. My brownness is the illustration of that collision, or the bland memorial of it. I stand before you as an impure American, an ambiguous American. In the 19th century, Texans used to say that the reason Mexicans were so easily defeated in battle was because we were so dilute. Being neither pure Indian nor pure Spaniard. Yet at the same time, Mexicans used to say that Mexico the country of my ancestry, joined two worlds, two competing armies. Jose Vasconcelos, the Mexican educator and philosopher, famously described Mexicans as la raza cosmica, the cosmic race. In Mexico, what one finds as early as the 18th century is a predominant population of mixed race people. Also, once the slave had been freed in Mexico, the incidence of marriage between Indian and African people there was greater than any other country in the Americas and has not been equaled since. Race mixture has not been a point of pride in America. Americans speak more easily about diversity than we do about the fact that I might marry your daughter. You might become we, and we might become us. America has so readily adopted the Canadian notion of multiculturalism 
because it preserves our, present, our preference for thinking ourselves separate. Our elbows need not touch. Thank you. I would prefer that table. I can remain Mexican, whatever that means, in the United States of America. I would, I would propose that instead of adopting the Canadian model of multiculturalism, America might begin to imagine the Mexican alternative, that of a mestizaje society. Because of colonial Mexico, I am mestizo, but I was reinvented by Rick President Richard Nixon. In the early 1970s, Nixon instructed the Office of Management and Budget to identify the major racial and ethnic groups in the United States. OMB came up with five ethnic or racial groups. The groups are white, black, Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian Eskimo, and Hispanic. It's what I learned to do when I was in college to call myself a Hispanic. At my university, we even had separate cafeteria tables and theme houses where the children of Nixon could gather of a feather. Native Americans United, African Americans, Casa Hispanic. The interesting thing about Hispanics is that you will never meet us in Latin America. You may meet Chileans, Peruvians, and Mexicans. You will not meet Hispanics. If you inquire in Lima or Bogota about Hispanics, you will be referred to Dallas for Hispanic is a gringo contrivance, a definition of the world according to European patterns of colonization. Such a definition suggests I have more in common with an Argentine Italians than with American Indians. That there is an effable union between white Cuban and the mulatto Puerto Rican because of Spain. Nixon's conclusion has become the basis for the way we now unorganize and understand American society. The Census Bureau foretold that by the year 2003, Hispanics would outnumber blacks to become the largest community minority in the United States. And indeed, the year 2003 has arrived and the proclamation of Hispanic essence Ascendancy has been published far and wide. While I admit a competition has existed, does exist, in America between Hispanics and Black people, I insist that the comparison of Hispanics with Blacks will lead ultimately to complete nonsense. For there is no such thing as a Hispanic race. In Latin America, one sees every race of the world. One sees white Hispanics, one sees Black Hispanics, one sees brown Hispanics, who are Indians, many of whom do not speak Spanish because they resist Spain. One sees Asian Hispanics. To compare Blacks and Hispanics, therefore, is to construct a fallacious equation. Some Hispanics have accepted the fiction. Some Hispanics have too easily accustomed themselves to impersonating a third race, a great new third race in America. But Hispanic is an ethnic term. It is a term denoting culture. So when the Census Bureau says by the year 2060, one third of all Americans will identify themselves as Hispanic, the Census Bureau is not speculating in pigment or quantifying according to actual historical narratives, but rather it is predicting how by the year 2060, one third of all Americans will identify themselves culturally. For a country from, from a community from blood and color, the new circumstance of so large a group of Americans identifying themselves vir by virtue of language or fashion or cuisine or literature is an extraordinary change and a revolutionary one. People ask me all the time if I envision another Quebec forming in the United States of the large immigrant movement from the South. Do I see Quebec forming in the Southwest, for example? No, I don't see that at all. 
but I do notice that Latin American immigrant population is as much as 10 years younger than the U.S. national population. I notice that Latin American immigrant population is more fertile than U.S. national population. I see the movement of immigrants from south to north as a movement of youth, like approaching spring, into a country that is growing middle-aged. I notice immigrants are the archetypal Americans at a time when we, U.S. citizens, have become post-Americans, most concerned with subsidized medications. I was at a small ap apostolic assembly in East Palo Alto a few years ago, a mainly Spanish-speaking congregation in an area along the freeway near the heart of the Silicon Valley. This area used to be Black East Palo Alto, but it's quickly becoming an Asian and Hispanic Palo Alto neighborhood. There was a moment in the service when newcomers to the congregation were introduced. Newcomers brought letters of introduction from sister evangelical churches in Latin America. The minister read out the various letters and pronounced the names and places of origin in the community. The congregation applauded, and I thought to myself, it's over. The border is over. These people were not being asked whether they had green cards. They were not being asked whether they arrived here legally or illegally. They were being welcomed within a new community for reasons of culture. There is now a north-south line that is theological, a line that cannot be circumvented by the U.S. Border Patrol. I was on a British Broadcasting Corporation interview show, and a woman introduced me as being in favor of assimilation. I'm not in favor of assimilation any more than I am in favor of the Pacific Ocean or climate weather. If I had a bumper sticker on the subject, it might read something like, assimilation happens. One doesn't get up in the morning as an immigrant child in America and think to oneself, how much of an American shall I become today? One doesn't walk down the street and decide to be 40% Mexican and 60% American. Culture is fluid. Culture is smoke. You breathe it, you eat it, you can't help hearing it. Elvis Presley goes in your ear and you cannot get Elvis Presley out of your mind. I am in favor of assimilation. I am not in favor of assimilation. I recognize assimilation. A few years ago, I was in Merced, California, a town about 75,000 people in the Central Valley where the two largest immigrant groups at that time, California so fluid, I believe this is no longer the case, were Laotian, Hmong, and Mexicans. Laotians have never in the history of the world, as far as I know, lived next to Mexicans. But there they were, in Merced, and living next to Mexicans. They don't like each other. I was talking to Laotian kids about why they don't like the Mexican kids. They were telling me that the Mexicans do this, the Mexicans don't do that, when I suddenly realized that they were speaking English with a Spanish accent. On his interview show, Bill Moyers once asked me how I thought of myself as an American or Hispanic? I answered that I'm Chinese, and that is because I live in a Chinese city and because I want to be Chinese. Well, why not? Some Chinese American people in Richmond and Sunset Districts of San Francisco sometimes paint their houses so many qualifiers in colors I would once have described as garish, lime greens, rose reds, pumpkin. But I have lived in a Chinese city for so long that my eye has taken on that palette, has come to prefer lime greens and rose reds and all the inventions of the Chinese Mediterranean. I see photographs in magazines or documentary footage of China, especially rural China, and I see what I recognize as home. Isn't that odd? I do think distinctions exist. 
I'm not talking about an America tomorrow in which we're going to find that black and white are no longer the distinguishing marks of separateness, but many young people I meet tell me they feel like Victorians when they identify themselves as black or white. They don't think of themselves in those terms, and they, they're already moving into a world in which tattoo or ornament or movement or commune or sexuality or drug or rape or electro electronic bombast are the organizing principles of their identity. The notion that they are white or black simply doesn't occur. And increasingly, of course, one meets children who really don't know what to say what they are. They simply are too many things. I met a young girl in San Diego at a convention of mixed race children, among whom the common habits is to define one parent over the other black over white, for example. But this girl said that her mother was Mexican and her father was African. The girl said, blacks again. By reinventing language, she is reinventing America. America does not have vocabulary like the vocabulary of the Spanish empire evolved to describe the multiplicity of racial possibilities in the new world. The conversation, the interior monologue of America cannot rely on old vocabulary, black, white. We are no longer a black, white nation. So what myth do we tell ourselves? The person who got closest to it was Karl Marx. Marx predicted that the discovery of gold in California would be more central to the event to the Americas than the discovery of the Americas by Columbus, which was only the meeting of two tribes, essentially, the European and the Indian. But when gold was discovered in California in the 1840s, the entire world met. For the first time in human history, all of the known world gathered. The Malaysian stood in the gold fields alongside the African, alongside the Chinese, alongside the Australian, alongside the Yankee. That was an event without parallel in world history and the beginning of modern California. Why California today provides the mythical structure for understanding how we might talk about the American experience, not as biracial, but as the recreation of the known world in the new world. Sometimes, truly revolutionary things happen without regard. I mean, we may wake up one morning and there is no black race. There is no white race either. There are mythologies. And as I am in the business, insofar as I'm in the business at all, of demythologizing such identities as black and white, I come to you as many cultures. I come to you as Chinese. Unless you understand 